Good afternoon. It's Teresa and we're in the garden with 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul talks about our warfare not being carnal or in the physical, but being a spiritual warfare. You're going to see a bunch of dragons behind me here on this little part that's up by my shoulders. And that's exactly what happens with us all the time. We have things that come against us that seem very scary, unsurmountable sometimes even. Some of these dragons, pretty scary looking. Three-headed dragons. We have a two-headed dragon over here. Each one of these dragons represent a different thing that Paul talks about in his lesson today. I have brought them here to show you that they are just plastic dragons. When it comes to God, they're not more powerful, but they seem to be on our shoulder, whispering in our ear all the time, defeating us in ways that we don't even realize that they can defeat us. They have all kinds of different colors. They have all kinds of different shapes. They have all kinds of different things that they represent. But the truth is, none of them are as powerful as God if we use the weapons that he's given us to fight them with. <clears throat> we do have to go into battle with them. What do you go into battle with when you have an argument with someone? There's a set of armor that I want to bring up that actually is talked about more in depth in Ephesians chapter 5. We will be getting there in probably about a year. But I want to bring them up to you right now. These are weapons that are defensive weapons except for one that's an offensive weapon. And every morning when I wake up, and I pray, I ask God to help me surrender myself completely to him as a living sacrifice so that he can show me the footsteps to walk in so that I can accomplish what he wants me to accomplish each day. So the first piece of armor that I put on is the belt of truth. These are child's toy armor but I use them in the children's church ministry a lot to try to get the kids' attention to let them know God has not placed them here defenseless. These first few bits of armor are defensive weapons. This belt of truth, God gives us his truth all the time. And it's supposed to be guarding us around our inner parts that are so sensitive because the truth sets you free and lies put you in bondage. So it's important to put on the belt of truth. So I'm going to put on the belt of truth. The next piece of armor I put on each day are the shoes that help me to spread the gospel of peace. It is important that we put these shoes on every day because they help us walk in peace with other people but they give us a help, a helper into the footsteps that we're supposed to walk in. It's part of our armor, our warfare that is spiritual. They're not meant to kick somebody. They're meant to help you walk in spaces of peace with other people and to spread the gospel of God's peace that Jesus brought us. The next piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. When we put on this breastplate of righteousness, it protects our heart because it helps us to remember Jesus was given all righteousness because he was righteous. And then he gave us his righteousness. When we do something wrong, we can ask him to forgive us. He doesn't want us to stay in a space of guilt. 
That's a dragon that can cause you to be in torment all the time. Dragons can torment you all the time. But with the breastplate of righteousness, we remember <clears throat> Jesus gave us our righteousness. It's not something that we earned or something that we could lose because it's a gift that Jesus gives us. The next piece of armor is the helmet of salvation. Let me get it here where you can see it. The helmet of salvation that we put on our heads that help us remember once we ask Jesus to save us, we have salvation. But we have to constantly remind our minds we are saved. We are saved. We are not lost anymore. We are saved. Jesus has saved us with his own blood. And if needs be, we put that covering over our eyes so that we see constantly we are saved. We are saved. We are saved. And it helps us to remember we are saved. The next piece of armor is the shield of faith. Now, when a person goes into battle, they put their armor in their left hand if they're right-handed, this shield. And then when somebody tries to come against them with a sword, they can put their shield up and defend themselves. The devil is always firing fiery darts at us to hurt us, to make us feel like we're not worth anything, that we don't have any worth. Our shield of faith, by faith, we believe that God will defend us. By faith, we believe that God will protect us. By faith, we believe that God will do everything he says to do. Remember a couple of weeks ago? We walk by faith, not by sight. We trust in God to defend us. The last piece of armor is the sword of the Spirit. All these other pieces of armor are defenses, defensive weapons. The shoes of peace that keep us from being tempted to kick somebody else. The uh, belt of truth that helps us keep ourselves in a space of truth. It sets us free. Breastplate of righteousness that helps us remember we're righteous. The helmet of salvation that helps us remember we're saved. The shield of faith. These defend us from the things that the enemy fires against us. But the sword of the Spirit, this looks like a sword. It's got two edges on it. And it cuts both ways. And that sword of the Spirit represents the Word of God. In Revelations, it says when Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation, he will have a sword in his mouth where he came as a suffering servant the first time. The next time he comes to the earth, I'm not talking about the rapture, but the next time he comes to the earth, he will have a sword in his mouth. That sword is the Word of God that's a double-edged sword that cuts through the lies of the enemy. So I wanted to go through that with you before we started what Paul said, because there's a reason. Paul says in chapter 10, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ. And you might think, why did you show us all this armor? You know, has to do with fighting, fighting, fighting. And then Paul starts talking about Jesus being gentle. Jesus is gentle. He came to earth the first time as a meek and gentle servant. But he had so much power and strength in his meekness that he was able to defeat the enemy when the enemy thought he had killed him. He just raised right back up with the power and strength of the life of God because God is the one on the throne and in control. And just like Jesus was meek, Paul too was meek. But Paul knew how to step up to the plate. This rebellious dragon is definitely rebellious here, trying to 
do other than what I want him to do. So Paul says, I appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ. Though I realize you think I'm timid in person and bold only when I write from far away. Because when he did write, he wrote with great boldness the corrections that he wrote in First and Second Corinthians to the Corinthian people were very strong and some of his words were very severe. So some people were saying, yeah, he, he makes a real mean talk when he writes us, but when he comes to us, he's real timid. Well, he wasn't really timid. He was just gentle with the gentleness and the kindness that Jesus brought the word of God. But it was brought after he had already told them what they needed to correct themselves with. He said, I'm begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. Those Judaizers, those people that were Jewish people that were telling the Corinthian church, oh, you've got to become Jewish before you get saved. You've, you've got to become a Jew. You've got to be circumcised. That wasn't the truth. It didn't come from the belt of truth. And Paul was trying to correct that. And he said, I'm correcting you strongly in a letter so that when I come in the presence, we won't be fighting. Because the way I am fighting these lies that are being told is through prayer and through correction and asking you to pray as well. Prayer is the best defense that we have in spiritual warfare. Not fighting with each other, arguing with each other, trying to duke it out. He says, we're human, but we don't wage war as humans do. Humans think of war with all these weapons and fighting and killing. The only thing that Paul was interested in killing was lies, untruths that were being told to the new believers in Corinth. He said, we use God's mighty weapons, not the worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. Human reasoning. Humans have two heads when they think about something. They go, well, this is how I think about it, but this is also how I think about it. So they've got a double-headedness. They've got a double-mindedness when they try to reason things out. Because the enemy is always on their shoulder trying to speak to them and say one thing or say something else. So this is double-mindedness and human reasoning. And it's like a dragon. How do you slay a dragon? You chop his head off. But how do you chop his head off? By not listening to the words that he says. Human reasoning and false argument. That false argument is right here too. Two heads speaking two different things. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. Oh, this dragon right here looks really proud. Ain't nobody going to tell me nothing because I know everything I need to know. Yeah. Pride comes before a fall. And the way you chop a proud dragon's head off is to submit and with humbleness and meekness submit to God. That's how you take out a proud dragon. We capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Well, we already talked about this three-headed rebellious dragon. All kinds of different reasons to do things other the way that God wants you to do. How do you chop off a three-headed dragon, rebellious dragon? How do you chop all three heads off? You surrender to doing things the way that God tells you to do them. And you don't listen to him anymore. You capture those rebellious thoughts and take them to the obedience of Christ. We already talked about false doctrines, but that's what this little guy represents. Believing things that aren't true just because it serves your purpose. How do you chop its head off? 
You go to the belt of truth. And you ask God, what is the truth? Where did my belt of truth go? You ask God to tell you the truth. And it busts the lies of this dragon. And it says, after we have become fully obedient, we punish everyone who remains disobedient. There's always somebody that sits there and whines. Everybody's against me and feels sorry for themselves. Nobody's against you. If you're for God, you're for everyone that's for God. And if you're not for God, you're going to end up belly up anyway. So we defeat that dragon that feels sorry for himself. And you get punished if you remain obedient because you're not with God. Paul says, look at the obvious facts. Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do and give other people the same consideration that you would want given to yourself. He says, I may be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord. Yes, the Lord gives you authority. He gives you the authority to use the name of Jesus. He gives you the authority to use his word to share with other people what will set them free. How to fight this spiritual battle because it's not a physical battle. I'm filming this today with my home in the background. That is where my biggest battle lies in the house, with the people I live with, because they see me every day. They see me get in my vehicle and leave. They see, my husband sees me getting my vehicle and leave, and I see him getting in his vehicle and leave. Leaving without allowing God to help you work through conflict doesn't solve much. Although sometimes when things get heated, it's good to withdraw a little while until God can speak to you and give you the truth. And then you come back together. Most marriages have conflict. And when people use hurtful words and bring up things that happened in the past, that's using physical means to fight your battle. But when you pray Pray through the argument. Pray together. Ask God to help both of you see where you're wrong. Admit where you're wrong. Don't let this proud dragon or this feeling sorry dragon come up and say anything in your ears. Get them dragons out of the way with prayer. Don't be allowing them to be in between you and someone else that you're in relationship with or you and people at your workplace. Don't be fighting your battles with all these weapons. You're liable to cut somebody and make them bleed. But if you fight your battles with spiritual war war warfare, other translations say our warfare is not carnal. Our warfare is not physical. Our warfare is fought in the spirit. Paul says, use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds. All those dragons were strongholds. Alcohol can be a stronghold. Drugs can be a stronghold. Movies, music, food, relationships can all be strongholds that are holding you back from every bit of peace that God has for you. When you fight your battles with spiritual warfare that God gives you, the belt of truth, the shoes that help you preach the gospel, breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation and deliverance, shield of faith, sword of the spirit. There's one more armor piece that doesn't even have a physical thing, and that's being able to pray in the spirit for the saints and watch for the saints. Let yourself see other people through God's eyes, not your own eyes. 
That's what Paul was trying to say. We need to look at the obvious fact. Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do. We need to look at other people through God's eyes, through Jesus' eyes. That's spiritual warfare also. Because in our flesh, we want to see all their mistakes that make us feel better about ourselves. That's being pompous. That's being proud. That proud dragon, we want to chop his head off. Paul says, I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord, but our authority builds you up. It doesn't tear you down. When we encourage people in this way to fight their battles with spiritual warfare, we're building them up. We're not tearing them down. We're just pointing out to them. You're fighting a battle with physical words, with physical fists, with physical manipulations that, by the way, are as witchcraft. And it's not going to work. It's not going to tear down the strongholds you want torn down in your relationships or in your addictions. The only thing that works is spiritual warfare. Paul says, so I'm not going to be ashamed of using my authority. And what he's talking about is praying over you, telling you the truth about how to fight this spiritual battle. He says, I'm not trying to fight, frighten you by my letters. Because some people say Paul's letters are demanding and forceful, but in poor person, he's weak and his speeches are worthless. Those people should realize our actions when we arrive in person will be as forceful as what we say in our letters from far away. His prayers over people when he's in person are just as powerful as his prayers when he's away. But the truth has to be spoken in order for people to realize what they're doing wrong that's defeating them in the first place, what they're doing when they're fighting battles in the physical. He says, oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are, but they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. We all know people that boast about how good they are. They're trying to lift themselves up. It's only good when God lifts you up or when somebody else lifts you up because when you try to boast about yourself, you're just being proud and boastful and like a hot air balloon, something can poke you and let all your air out. Someone can expose your weaknesses very easily. Measuring yourself against somebody else and comparing yourself with somebody else is ignorant, Paul says. It's ignorant. It's using physical warfare, physical words for physical warfare. When you try to raise yourself up by putting somebody else down or raise yourself up, period, yourself, you're just like that hot air balloon. Somebody's going to poke you and you're going to deflate and fall to the ground. Pride comes before a fall. We will not boast about the things done outside our authority. We will only boast about what has happened within the boundaries of the work God has given us, which includes our working with you. We are not reaching beyond these boundaries when we claim authority over you as if we had never visited you. My goodness, Paul started this church in Corinth. For we were the first to travel all the way to Corinth with the good news of Christ. And he was. Nor do we boast and claim credit for the work someone else has done. That's what these Judaizers did. They wanted to claim credit for forming the church in Corinth, and it simply wasn't true. Paul says, instead, we hope your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. Paul wanted them to take the things he had taught them and go teach other people. That's how their boundaries would be extended. This was Paul's prayer for them. 
he didn't want them to just stay like the Jewish people did. God gave us these laws in their mind. They're mine. I'm not going to share them with anyone. Paul wanted him to take the principles and the teachings that Jesus had taught him, that he taught them, and teach other people. That's what sharing the gospel is all about. And when you come in conflict with someone, you don't sit there and argue with them. You, you pray. Everyone has a right to their opinion. But prayer can change a person's mind much better than you hammering them like this. That's a physical warfare. That's not God's spiritual warfare. Paul says, We hope your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. Then we will be able to go and preach the good news in other places far beyond you where no one is working. Paul has already taught them and now there's other places that he wants to go to that God is calling him to. But if he stays there and keeps spoon feeding them, he's not going to reach other people. He says, there will be no question about our boasting about work done in someone else's territory because they're not going to claim that they did work in someone else's territory. As scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord and what the Lord has done in your life. When people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend, to commend them. We all like to be praised. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we praise God, rather than praising ourselves, patting ourselves on the back, we are honoring what God has done through us. Remember, we're like a water faucet. We are the faucet. We're not the source the water comes from, but the water comes through us. And if we let the Holy Spirit be what turns the water on and turns the water off, and the degree the water is going to flow, then we are using spiritual warfare, allowing the Holy Spirit to fight the battle for us. That's what God wants. So I encourage you to do that this week, to think about these things. And we're going to talk next week more about those false apostles that were teaching people the wrong things. But he's also going to talk about how he fought them with spiritual warfare. I'm going to see you next week in the garden. I look forward to being here with you. Until then, fight your battles in the spiritual realm. I'll see you next week in the garden.